Celebrating 43 years on the air, Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, the UN paints a grim picture of agriculture in the future and says you should eat less meat. Here's one way to do that, is it mission impossible? Fast food goes meatless, we take a whopper of a bite. In Southern gardening, it's called a hell strip. It might feel like a demon, but there's a kinder, gentler side too. And finally, the art of the hedge. Students learning how to manage the risk farmers face every day. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everybody, I'm Mike Russell. Good to have you with us today on Farm Week. It seems the whole world is talking about the trade war with China. President Trump said he was about to levy another 10% on Chinese goods September 1st. That has since been delayed until December. In the meantime, though, the Chinese responded, putting U.S. farmers, ranchers, and consumers in the middle. Here's Peter Tubbs. Both commodity and financial markets roiled this week after President Donald Trump proposed a new round of tariffs on imports from China. The Chinese government responded by halting all purchases of farm commodities from the United States. China is the second largest export destination for U.S. farmers. Well, their announcement that they are going to basically stop importing all U.S. farm commodities uh, products, uh, to quote our president, Zippy Duval, uh, when he said yesterday, uh, it is a body blow, and I don't know any other way to describe it. Uh, it is a punch in the gut that is just taking away one of the most important and, and largest markets that we've spent decades developing. The new proposed tariffs, which will go into effect September 1st, will cover the 300 billion of goods imported from China, not currently subject to tariff. The new batch of tariffed goods will cover more consumer products, raising prices for both importers and American consumers. China also caused market drama when it announced that the yuan would be allowed to drop to an 11-year low against the dollar. It has already lost 5% of its value this year. The president charged that action constitutes currency manipulation. The Trump administration is currently doling out its second round of tariff relief checks to commodity farmers, relief that could total $26 billion once completed. The president questioned reports of producer unrest in rural America and believes farmers are happy with the financial assistance. Well, you interviewed the wrong farmer, number one. Number two, any amount that China sucks out, we're making up out of the billions of dollars that we're taking in. Remember this, our country is taking in billions and billions of dollars from China. We never took in 10 cents from China. And out of that many billions of dollars, we're taking a part of it and we're giving it to the farmers because they've been targeted by China. The farmers, they come out totally whole. So you interviewed the wrong farmer. The USDA says one farmer feeds 155 people a year. But a recent study says holding on to that number could prove challenging as the population grows and the climate changes. Meanwhile, the United Nations piled on to that news as the planet's population ticks toward 8 billion. Here's John Torpy agricultural industry received an extra helping of bad news as a newly released report put farming in a negative light. Over 100 scientists from 52 countries signed off on a United Nations white paper at the end of this week. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change concluded human actions on the land are increasing global carbon dioxide levels. In turn, the report reveals the higher CO2 levels are degrading the quality of food being grown. Released this week in Geneva, the study concludes the global temperature will increase 1.5 degrees Fahrenheit in the next 50 years and could increase food insecurity worldwide. However, authors of the study say a change in human behavior may be the best plan for combating the problem. Some diets require more land and water and lead to higher emissions than others. For example, diets that are high in grains, nuts and vegetables have a lower carbon footprint than those that are high in meat and they lead to better health outcomes. 
For more than a year now, as plant-based and lab-grown meat alternatives have grown more popular, we've been asking the question, what is meat? Especially as product labeling becomes a more controversial issue. Now, a popular fast food outlet has chosen to accept its impossible mission after a short test marketing period. Here to tell us all about it is Farm Week Field reporter Amy Myers. Amy? Mike, it's official. Burger King makes going meatless possible with the Impossible Whopper just rolled out nationwide a few days ago. As the fast food industry strives to meet changing consumer tastes, more meatless alternatives are being tested by more outlets. At the same time, Mississippi's Ag Commissioner Andy Gibson says customers should know what's in the burgers they're ordering, which is why the state's tough new fake meat law is in place. We've got to make sure that with labeling and with uh, consumer education, they know what they are purchasing. We will be reviewing these products to make sure that they are being accurately labeled. And if it's uh, not meat, it should not say it is meat or claimed to be an alternative meat of some sort. For example, the Impossible Whopper. On the wrapper, it said 100% Whopper, 0% beef. Well. That's pretty clear. With ingredients like soy, potato protein, coconut oil, and sunflower oil, you might wonder how the Impossible Whopper tastes. Of course, I'm never one to miss a culinary sampling. So here we go. Hmm. It really does taste like a real hamburger. Of course, there's nothing quite like the real thing. Now for the real test. Let's see if folks can tell the difference between the impossible and regular Whopper without being told which is which. I think this one is the veggie burger, and I think this is a regular Whopper. Impossible Whopper. I can definitely tell that it was, it was different. For it being a veggie burger, it's pretty close. I didn't think it was bad or anything. Mostly, I typically eat beef, but it could definitely work as an alternative, I think. So let's imagine meatless meat does become a staple. What would that mean to beef producers? I think the question really is, are we going to see consumers swap from a traditional burger to this burger? The studies that have been done are, are not suggesting that we're going to see that kind of shift. People that already eat those types of things might be more attracted to something like the Impossible Burger. Not a lot of concern for the beef markets just yet, but it is something that's on the horizon. Josh Maples makes a good point. If you're likely to eat the Impossible Whopper because you think it's healthier, keep this in mind. It still has 630 calories, 58 grams of carbs, and more than 1,000 milligrams of sodium. And here in Mississippi, it actually costs a dollar more than a regular Whopper, so price may be a consideration. Mike? Thanks, Amy. I actually tried the Impossible Whopper the day it rolled out. Not bad, but at that price, all things considered, in my opinion, I know where the beef is. I'll stick with that version. Well, as, I, as we said at the beginning of the show, that little strip of grass between the sidewalk and the street is called a hell strip. At times, it might feel like a demon, but there can be a kinder, gentler side of this little piece of landscape. Here's Gary. A horticultural challenge for many homeowners is an area known as the Hell Strip, the space between the sidewalk and the street. What's a home gardener to do in this difficult area? Hmm, Gary, this hell strip is my domain. Leave it be, because it's a lost cause. <laughs> oh, come on, Gary. I've got confidence in your gardening abilities. Let's turn this hell strip into our garden of Eden. You're right. Let's do this. Turning your hell strip into a garden is a challenge, but the effort is often worth it. The first thing I did was pick plants that are really great performers. My go-to annuals are always marigolds. I love these yellow and orange African marigolds. These plants are sure to grow in tough situations. Another tough annual is Melampodium because they're heat tolerant and produce a boatload of one half inch yellow flowers even in the hot and humid conditions in Mississippi gardens. These easy to grow plants are short and rounded 
making them a fantastic choice for my Hellstrip. Zahara zinnias are always a great pick. I chose the lemonade mix having yellow, white, and fire-colored flowers. For a hot garden space, Celosia is the right choice. The All America selection, Fresh Look Red, looks great planted in small groups. I also planted Bright Ideas Sweet Potato. I love how the black and rusty red fills into and around the marigolds, melon podium, celosia, and zinnia. Wow, we did it! This looks great! It sure does. Our own tiny slice of heaven. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman, and I'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. <laughs> Gary Bachman taking the risk out of gardening. Speaking of risk, later in the show, an inside look at a college program that teaches ag students how to manage and minimize risk in farm production, a huge issue these days. That program is at the University of Idaho. Here at Mississippi State, ag economist Josh Maples teaches his students some of the same kinds of material. I asked him what kind of a role such a program plays in today's ag environment. I think it's critical. I think it's one of the best uh, topics that we should cover for people, our students who are going into agriculture. And so here at Mississippi State, I teach the commodity futures uh, and options class, and a big part of that is risk management. We spend extensive time uh, making sure students know how to do a hedge, and so how they, so that they understand how to use futures and options. Uh, to hedge away some of the risk that is inherent to agricultural production. And I think that's just going to be even more and more important as we go further. Uh, and this year has been a clear example with all of the uncertainty that are in, it's in all markets, and especially in ag markets right now. Uh, it's been a year for risk management to really become something that needs to be done and almost has to be done uh, for anybody who's wanting to stay in ag production very long. Time now for today's trivia quiz. The ag world is talking a lot about commodities, what with all of the craziness, craziness early in the year. One of those commodities is corn, of course. The government's just released WASDE report has corn yield and acreage much higher than expected, 13.9 billion bushels harvested, beating estimates by nearly a billion bushels. Today's question, just in case you don't know, how is corn most used in the U.S.? Is the answer A, animal feed, B, biofuels, C, food, or D, export? We'll have the answer coming up. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up in our Farm Week feature, a career in agriculture. It's not just about riding a tractor or feeding the livestock. There is, of course, a heck of a lot more to it. As we all know, variables are everywhere, and so's the uncertainty. Loss could come from almost anywhere. And that's what these students are learning in one of the most sophisticated college curricula in the nation. Managing risk, it's the art of the hedge, coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. Mississippi 4-H celebrates a rich history of youth development through creative hands-on experiences. Programs emphasize leadership, technology, science, and agriculture. But it's a lot more than that. making the best better. Before we get back to the market report, let's take a look at the Farm Week calendar. First, on August 23rd from 8.30 to 2.15 at the Lowndes County Extension Office, a workshop for game camera surveys and forest management for white-tailed deer. This is a detailed workshop for those who want to know more about a science-based approach to estimating deer herd and improving wildlife habitat while maintaining profitable timber production. Registration is due by August 16th, but you can pay at the door. For more info, call Reed Nevins at 662-328-2111. Next, a big head start on this one, the always popular Breakfast on the Farm, October 17th through 19th from 9 a.m. to noon at the Bearden Dairy Research Center at MSU in Starkville. Learn where your food comes from, milk a cow, tour the dairy. The first two days are for school field trips. The 19th is open to the public. 
Registration opens this fall. For more info, call Amanda Stone at 662-769-9941. In Soybeans, analyst John Roach asked the question, how aggressive would you be in marketing the 2020 and 2021 crop? The markets are saying not to grow beans, though at 755 million bushels, ending stocks were off 40 million bushels from last month's numbers in the latest WASD report. Here's John with his thoughts. Talking about selling, it's, it's sort of like uh, violating every rule I know. Uh, and when I look out f and talk about selling next year's crop at price levels that really don't have much of any profit in them, uh, where we still have to go through a growing season in this country in the next month, we have another growing season in South America and then another growing season for the U.S. before we have to sell some of that 2020 crop. So this, the whole idea that we're rushing out to sell things because we're scared to death, in my years of doing this business, that's the biggest mistake you can make. You make sales because it makes sense to make sales and your, and your signals and your indicators are telling you to do that. And right now, we don't have that. What we do have is fear. In the cattle markets, late breaking news, a fire at a beef plant in Kansas may impact production numbers. That plant processed 6,000 head a day, about 6% of U.S. capacity. In turn, prices could see an uptick. Prior to that, I spoke to economist Josh Maples about the latest inventory report. Josh, the uh, mid-year cattle inventory report released at the end of July. Did you see any surprises in there? There really weren't a lot of surprises in this particular report, Mike. It was pretty well anticipated. Uh, looking at the total number of uh, beef cows, right around 32 million head. No change from last year for that number. Mm. Um, looking at the number of uh, Heifers held back for beef replacements. That was the one that probably most people were watching. Uh, lower than a year ago uh, adds another piece to the story that the herd growth has slowed. Uh, and then also the one that maybe could be classified as a bit of a surprise, but not too much, would be the uh, the calf crop number. So that's the number of calves that we expect to hit the ground in 2019. Actually came in a little bit lower. Uh, than the 2018 number, so looking at fewer calves on the ground this year than a year ago. But all in all, well anticipated, no big surprises, and it all kind of keeps us on the same thinking that we were pre-report. How about the implications of the large number of cattle on feed? Yeah, so at the same time we got the inventory report, we also got a uh, cattle on feed report, and July 1, uh, largest number of cattle on feed for any July 1 report that we had. Uh, that we've had since the series began in the 1990s. You know, this is another record. We're continuing to push these large number of cattle through feedlots. And I think it really tells the story of cattle and the beef production system. You know, we've got these natural lags. We look at the inventory numbers that says the cow herd is flattened. You know, we're not growing there. But then we've got these larger and larger number of cattle coming through feedlots. And that's because it takes a while to get them through the system. So even though herd growth is flattened, we're going to see larger beef production over the next couple of years as we work through those previously large supplies. Uh, the question then becomes, where do we go from here? We're not yet talking about declines. We're not talking about herd contraction that might lead to really, you know, to, to not really provide some support for prices. Uh, we're just kind of in a waiting period to see if there's any strong uh, signal that's going to push producers to either continue to expand or if they're going to start uh, contracting. So I think it's a hold, hold and see pattern right now. Back to the trivia quiz. Earlier we talked about the corn numbers after this week's WASD report. The question, how is corn most used in the U.S.? Is the answer animal feed, biofuels, food, or as an export product? Really kind of a trick question. It's used for all of those, but the top use of corn by a slim margin is for biofuel production, ethanol. Nearly 40% of American corn goes for that, so the right answer is B. Right behind biofuels at around 33% is animal feed. It's fed to livestock. The U.S., by the way, is the world's largest producer of corn. With all that in mind, trading commodities is a challenge even for those with years of experience and fully understanding the lingo, lingo can be overwhelming for beginners. As promised, Josh Bittner shows us one classroom helping train the next generation in the art of the hedge. Here's Josh. Turning a profit through Mother Nature can be precarious, 
a fact of which America's farmers are acutely aware. Things like soil health and weather intersect with fluctuating input costs, trade disruptions, and an array of other variables, creating perpetual uncertainty. So as agricultural products move from the field to end users, financially offsetting such potential losses, or hedging, has become essential. And the University of Idaho's Agricultural Commodity Risk Management Program is giving the next generation of traders, managers, and merchandisers a leg up securing operational viability while learning to maximize profits. The program is relatively new. It's built upon the shoulders of a program in the College of Business, and we complement that by focusing on agricultural commodities. Almost in unprecedented territory. Clinical assistant professor Norm Ruhoff says commodities are a fundamental component of the U.S. economy, and three sectors, potatoes, grains, and dairy, form the core of Idaho's contribution. And by harnessing basis, the difference between the cash price of a commodity and its Board of Trade futures price, farmers can lock in prices and join speculators making money as markets rise and fall. What if we see an opportunity where basis weakens seasonally? Growing up on an Idaho family farm and cutting his teeth at a local grain elevator, Ruhoff later spent years in the Midwest commodity trade before returning home to impart bins full of knowledge. We were kind of trading a reversion back to the mean. Ruhoff's students get their feet wet with supply and demand analysis, form risk management strategies, and dive into real-world experience. We'd like to sell that 5,000 bushels cash grain at 568 to you. Students in our case have a chance to actually trade the actual commodity and take on the futures position to hedge that. So from an agribusiness perspective, it's about margin management, sustainability of the family farm. So what we try to do is teach them the concept of if you own a bushel of wheat, what kind of risk do you encounter in the marketplace? So once they buy that bushel of wheat, they can actually sell that back to the cash market, do nothing, be exposed to market risk, or hedge it. And that's essentially selling it on the futures market. But understanding puts and calls is a process, even for students who grew up around agriculture. I remember my very first day in this class, and I remember the first question I asked, I raised my hand and said, Norm, you're teaching us how to gamble. Why don't we just go play blackjack? I was looking at uh, candlesticks and uh, the way that prices were moving and how you could go long and make money if the prices went up or short, make money if the prices go down. Colt Stoll had zero knowledge of hedging practices before being immersed in Ruhoff's curriculum, just like Cole Likely, a fifth-generation cattle rancher from southern Idaho now one of a handful of students who graduate having earned a Series 3 license with the National Futures Association, a self-regulatory organization designed to safeguard the U.S. derivatives industry. It was a really big eye-opener and it just captured me from the beginning and ever since learning about it in Norm's very introductory class, I've, I've just put everything I can into it to try to understand the industry more so you can go back and help those ranchers manage their risk and stay sustainable. After graduation, Likely begins work as a cattle broker in Nebraska, while classmate Justin Chapman starts his career trading grain in North Dakota. I'm tickled pink about, you know, the commodity markets and all the different moving parts of being a merchandiser and also being able to connect with farmers and, um, you know, just kind of learning about their traditions. Chapman and Bailey Storms both came to the Commodity Risk Management Program without a farming background, but have found intense personal and professional value from their education. I'm going in to be a credit officer trainee, and I am going to need to have a knowledge base of markets in order to most effectively help those customers. So that was something that was really important for me. The agriculture industry is bullish about the things happening in Moscow, Idaho. The school's graduates are sought out nationwide to trade commodities around the globe. Earlier this year, the Idaho Wheat Commission, an industry advocate dedicated to education, research, and market development, announced a $2 million endowment to help the University of Idaho expand its program by establishing a chair of risk management. Boy, did I get a lesson. <laughs> Commissioner Bill Flory, who graduated from the school decades before the risk management program came into being, runs a diverse operation in the northern part of the state. He's impressed by the caliber being cultivated at his alma mater today. Norm is just an outstanding prof. I mean, he's got the real world experience. He's really well grounded. He listens, he lets them run. You know, I mean, it's just, classroom is very dynamic and it's very important. Yeah. 
Yeah, appreciate it. I think you're definitely on the right track. That's what this program does, is interfaces very directly with industry and, and with producers and provides great utility as far as an understanding of the complexities of markets and hedging and risk management. Similar approaches are scarce across America's academic landscape, and university staff beam with pride over what they've helped build. Really, I look back on my career, and this is an opportunity for me to really pay it forward. I'm a third-generation grain merchandiser, followed my father and grandfather into a small country operation. And beyond that, out of a family of eight kids, six of us graduated from the university. So very proud to see what we're doing with our program and putting recognition out there for the University of Idaho. Ag education has come a long way. Well, next week on the show in central Milwaukee, in one of the nation's poorest areas, a success story, Fondy Farms. Two dozen farmers renting an acre apiece, producing 70 kinds of crops that feed the neighborhood. And this farmer's market processes 12 times the snap dollars of the average market. They're gardening for growth, and it's a win-win next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.